Behind the beachheads of the Pacific lies the jungle, and in it, the enemy. But here, there is not only the fanaticism of the Jap, there is the poison of an unfamiliar tree, the sudden danger of an insect bite, the fierceness of the heat, the disease of a polluted swamp. Here is where the silence presses in on a man, then suddenly breaks. These are the things that bring fear, the kind of fear which becomes caution, and in time, knowledge. Aided in this by the skill and experience of the medical men, our armies are turning to advantage the hostility of the jungle, and are pushing back their enemies on the march from island to island in the oceans of the South Pacific. The education starts with a boat ride into the teeth of the opposition. Alligators, buffaloes, Amtraks, landing barges. The ramps go down. For the first few minutes, it's every man for himself. Every man, that is, except the aid man. He goes to work with the first bullet in the first leg. That means a wounded soldier on a litter. And another casualty list has been started. The shore party sets up a beach evacuation station, the first medical installation to come in. It's too early in the battle for medical facilities to be anything but limited. So casualties are evacuated seaward to the troop transports, which become temporary floating hospitals. One minute, these men are part of a hard, tough fighting machine. The next minute, casualties, being handled with sudden gentleness as they're given medical care and a boat ride back to the mothership. But the war is just beginning for most of them, and wave after wave of assault troops pour in. With them come the battalion aid stations. Their immediate job is to help treat casualties at the beach evacuation station, and then to follow inland with the fighting. Soon after come collecting detachments to assist the evacuation. Then a clearing station comes in to forge the chain more strongly. The supplies are coming in too. A beachhead has been won, and this is what consolidates it. Amidst all the weapons of destruction, instruments of healing. Here are morphine and surgical equipment. Somewhere else there are crates filled with ether and bandages, dressings and atabrine, plasma and novocaine. Nothing has been left to a bad guess. The supply line is unwound. The troops move inland. With them go the aid men, the litter bearers, and the battalion aid station. Tanks shoved through the jungle. Behind them come rifles, machine guns, BARs, and the medics. The fight is always lurking behind the next rise in ground. proceeding according to plan. Another headline for home to celebrate. But now comes the long, tedious job of clearing out the enemy. All of them. Clearing them out and learning some more about the land they've infested. Thirst hits every man right at the beginning. So water discipline must begin immediately. Experience with polluted streams and water holes has taught that the first swallow is sometimes the beginning of the last. So as soon as possible, the purification units come up to take the danger of dysentery out of the water. In the meantime, you make it safe yourselves with water purification tablets or enlister bags. And you swallow salt tablets too, to make up for all the salt the sweat pours out of your bodies. After you thirst, you hunger. 
There finally comes a time when you can get that one hot meal a day. But you discover that along with the food, dysentery and diarrhea also sit in a dirty mess kit. So you sterilize everything you eat with, before and after. And then with a full gut, you look around for a handy latrine, only to realize that it's just the nearest clearing in the jungle. So you dig your cat hole or your straddle trench, because you know the flies are waiting to feed on your waste deposits. And then go straight to some of that early chow and feed some more. You throw back the dirt on your deposit, bury it deep. Then you start playing tag with the night. That first night in a strange land with strange smells and strange noises. A man can get weird ideas out here, no matter how brave he is. There's a Jap. The giveaway shot chases a harmless parakeet through the underbrush. These are terrifying things in a strange land in the dead of night. The doctors have learned to talk men out of many queer notions that a little knowledge of the jungle would have calmed. Today hits with the sticky humidity of yesterday. You get online at sick call and begin finding out the meaning of fungus infection. Trees and shrubs you brush against leave a rash on your body. Scratches turn serious and become infected. And infections bring tropical ulcers, jungle rot, naga sores. Dirt on the body causes much of it too. So whenever you can, you hit the water. But only after it's been inspected. Wash your feet, wash your socks, wash your clothing. These are commands that become the routine if you want to stay healthy. Sleep off the damp ground. Improvise hammocks if you can't get one of these. You catch on quickly to the tricks the jungle teaches you. Not as prevalent as skin infections, but more dangerous are the germs which carry typhus, typhoid, cholera, and yellow fever. Against these, we use no tricks but the results of years of medical research, inoculation. Research, too, against the most vicious of all, malaria. While the forward units are mopping up the island, the rear areas are busy tracking down and isolating the malarial mosquito. Blood smears are taken and examined minutely for signs and traces. Swamps are inspected for larvae floating in the filth of them. These medical men are killers, too. They study an area, examine their findings, then go out armed to the teeth. They clear away the vegetation along streams, throwing light on the dark places where malaria waits patiently for the carelessly exposed arm or leg. They spray and oil swamps, and drain them when they can. And up at the front, the mosquito takes a beating, too. The don'ts of staying healthy are posted in every gathering place. Smear on insect repellent. Wear head nets. Use mosquito bars at night. Take an aerosol bomb and spray your foxhole or your dugout. Don't forget your atabrine or quinine. These are the things a man learns to do automatically. These are the things the doctors have learned to check with careful regularity. But all these precautions need supplies, and they never stop pouring in. On trucks, on the backs of horses and bulky mules, on the backs of GIs, on the backs of stolid natives who know shortcuts and ways to surmount the insurmountable. When the order for supplies comes in underlined for speed, this is how it's done.
Sometimes it's the only way supplies can get where they're going. Supplies for the medics, supplies for the battle. But the battle is not nearly so important to the man who was hurt as the evacuation of the wounded. In the fire and smoke of it, this is the first job of the medic. The man is hit and an aid man gets to his side. Stopping the first spurt of blood is all important. Months of training have gone into dressing a head wound, and giving a shot of morphine to dull the pain. The minutes get crowded. Sometimes there are more emergencies than medics. So they take a rifleman and stick a litter in his hand. But evacuation never stops. Speed is the toughest commodity to get in the jungle, but somehow they manage to get it. The going is hard and laborious. Over logs and through swamps, it's raised litter, carry litter, lower litter. Some of the wounded are able to walk by themselves. But the destination from the front is always the same, the battalion aid station. It's actually nothing more than organized emergency treatment protected from enemy fire by trees and whatever other natural concealment there is. Right off the bat, a medical officer makes out the man's emergency medical tag. Name, rank, serial number, cause of wound, type of wound, prescribed treatment, and what's been done for him so far. This EMT is now as much a part of him as the wound he received. And every stage in his emergency treatment will be recorded on it. The medics have sweated supplies up here with them. Now these are put to work on wounded hands, wounded legs, wounded arms, wounded faces. There isn't any time wasted. Ingenuity replaces the elaborate. Wounds are checked. Splints are applied. Plasma is given. That's the procedure. If a little attention is all a man needs, he gets it and then rejoins his outfit. For the others, it's just a momentary pause in transit. In this kind of campaign, the chances are that vehicles can't be brought up. That means another long litter journey, this time back to the collecting station. The litter bearers are grateful for those who can make it on foot. This is the collecting station. It's farther behind the lines and less rushed. But for the majority of cases, the layover here is still only temporary. The casualty comes in. His short case history is read in a glance and they know just what to do for him if anything immediate has to be done. A shot of plasma may be the answer. Or some sulfur tablets. or merely a moment of rest while waiting for the next lap. The casualties are constantly being arranged into two groups, the ones who go back to the front and the ones who go back. When a collecting company comes ashore, it brings quarter-ton trucks which are made into ambo peeps. Into these now go the more serious cases. There stay at the collecting station just one more line on their EMTs. The next stop is the clearing station. And at getting to it, minor miracles of transportation become the order of the day. This is the clearing station, farther to the rear than the collecting station. Here too, the emphasis is on speed and handling all kinds of emergencies. No private wards, and the treatment rooms are probably improvised. Perhaps a captured Jap dugout. But time grows short, and 
wounds can't wait. The scalpels and forceps and scissors brought up here hours ago are no longer the inanimate things known as supplies. Now, in the hands of the doctors, they are vital instruments of life saving. Then there is the portable surgical hospital, which pays roving center near and around the front. It's designed to move fast, to get to the areas where the casualties are heaviest. It specializes in surgery which must be immediate, the operation which must be done now to save a man. A basin filled with soap and water and hard, meticulous scrubbing sterilize the surgeon's hands. Into those hands go knowledge and experience the life of their next patient. There's no loudspeaker calling the doctor to surgery. There are no long, cool, white corridors down which the patient is wheeled. But two GIs, being as gentle as they can, place the wounded man on the operating table, and all at once, this becomes the finest medical care in the world. When the danger point is passed, the journey continues. From the portable surgical hospitals and from the clearing stations, the casualties are loaded onto trucks and ambulances. They are driven either to an airfield or to an evacuation hospital located near the beachhead and well out of artillery range. This is where they get their first relief from speed and the word emergency. Here is where they get cleanliness and a taste of tranquility. Here there is time to care for a man's injuries thoroughly, perhaps cure them completely and return the man to the front lines. No delicate piece of surgery is beyond the skill and facilities of the evacuation hospital. For some, the trek is over, but for others, it has only really begun. As soon as it's possible, they're moved to the beach where they're loaded onto barges and landing boats. The ramp goes up this time, and for its cargo, temporarily at least, the war is over. From small craft to hospital ship, where a man gets a glimpse of the detailed and complete medical care to come. Where our troops have captured an airfield or had time to clear a strip for their own use, Casualties are evacuated by plane. This is the procedure to fit in perfectly with a chain of evacuation based on speed and immediate medical treatment. Everything humanly possible is done to bring home and make sound again the minds and the bodies that hit the beachhead a few short hours or days ago. It's in the roar of the C-47s, the sweat and the skill of the medics. This was the job to be learned. This is the way they learned it. Yeah. 